William Marshall rose from obscurity in medieval England to become the winner of tournaments and the counselor and companion of kings. He may just have been the greatest knight who ever lived. We sure think so. Welcome to part two of the career of one of medieval England's most famous knights, William Marshall. Hello, footnoting history friends. It's Kristen here with Christine and the thrilling conclusion of the story of one of the greatest knights who ever lived, William Marshall. If you missed part one, you'll probably want to pause now and listen, but you'll still be able to follow along with us here, even if you haven't. Remember that if you'd like a captioned version of this episode, you can find it on the Footnoting History website, as well as our YouTube channel. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you to our Patreon and Ko-Fi supporters, and all you Footnoting History fans out there who have purchased merchandise from our Tee Public Shop. We are so grateful to you for helping us keep Footnoting History running. Yes, thank you for everything you do. Every little bit helps us so much. Now for William. Last time, we went from the 1140s to the early 1180s. Today, we are going to pick up in 1186, when William was about 40, and see it all the way through his death and, honestly, beyond into the modern pop culture world. So, just as Christine said, when last we left our noble knight, William Marshall, we were in the later 1180s, and he was in Jerusalem on a spiritual errand for the late Henry the Young King. Although we don't know exactly what William did there because he didn't tell us and neither did his 13th century biographer in the history of William Marshall. Marshall had survived the Civil War of the 12th century, became a successful knight in his 20s by winning lots of medieval tournaments, Woo! and one after another, he served important roles in the courts of English kings. Indeed, he did. And serving those kings brought him the opportunity to do something he probably could never have dreamed of otherwise, marrying a woman named Isabel de Clare. And it's his marriage to her that is our first great moment in William Marshall's life Yay. for this episode. Yes. So when William returned from doing we don't know what, in Jerusalem in 1186, <laughs> he was welcomed back into the household of King Henry II. And his loyalty to whomever he was assigned continued, just like we said last time that he stuck with the young king in rebellion against Henry II. Now he was equally loyal to Henry II. He acted as a leader of the royal household guard and supported Henry on campaign against the French and against Henry's son, Richard, when family issues over inheritance and power had yet again turned into all-out warfare. Notably, a story comes down to us through the biography that says at one point, William and Richard came face to face in a spot where William could have put an end to the possible future king. Just as Stephen had once spared him, so William spared Richard. The way that it's described is that Richard said it would be wrong for William to kill him. And William basically replied, no, let the devil kill you, for I won't. But instead of killing Richard, he killed his horse. Oof. This does not, let us be clear, count toward the balance of William Marshall's awesomeness, in our opinion. That poor horse. But I guess he had to, he had to make some sort of statement, I guess, right? I guess. Yeah, poor horse. But to get to his marriage, the point is that William stayed with Henry II to his death, which came in July of 1189. Not long before that, Henry had promised William a bride in the form of the aforementioned Isabel de Clare. Born sometime between 1170 and 1176, Isabel was a major heiress. Her mother, Aoife, was the daughter of an Irish king of Leinster, and her father was Richard de Clare, also known as Strongbow, who was, well, quite frankly, he was a big player in the English invasion of Ireland. He was English, and he answered the Irish king's request for aid. And then once he provided that aid, he was given the hand of the king's daughter in return. I talk about this in my very first footnoting history episode, like way back in 2013. 
If I did that topic now, I would do it differently. But hey, everyone grows over the years. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, but I did do it. As always, I digress. So when Henry II died and Richard went from possible heir to actual heir, he honored his father's promise. I told Christine when we were planning this episode that we have to include this bit. Allegedly, William was so excited when he got the news that he was allowed to marry Isabel that he ran to the ship and fell off the gangplank. And they had to fish him out of the water, <laughs> which is just a great story. And he was fine. He's like a quirky Hallmark hero. <laughs> <laughs> they were married quickly and had 10 children together. Five girls, Matilda, Isabel, Sybil, Eve, and Joan, and five boys. William, Richard, Gilbert, Walter, and Anselm. Wow. Yeah. Eventually, in 1199... King John would make William the Earl of Pembroke, title with ties to Isabel's family. It had been given to Isabel's paternal grandfather by King Stephen, but it was later pretty much withheld from Isabel's father by Henry II. William receiving the title restored it back to Isabel's family line. Also, every time the title gets given anew, the number starts at one again, which always blew my mind. <laughs> so William is called the first Earl of Pembroke, even though he isn't the literal first person to ever have that title. His and Isabel's sons would also be the Earl of Pembroke. Why? Because none of William's sons ever had sons. So instead of it going down the male line from father to son, it went from father to son and then brother to brother. After that point, they ran out of male descendants and the title kind of, you know, went back to the crown or whatever. But despite William and Isabel's significant age difference. And for those keeping track, it was somewhere between 25 and 30 years. Yes, their relationship appears to have been pretty successful. At least we don't have any indication that they had periods of estrangement, though I'm sure they argued every now and then, like all people do. Especially when you have 10 kids. Yeah, for sure. For example, it is believed that she disagreed one time when William decided to pardon some vassals who she didn't think deserved it. But overall, they, they seem to have been at least content companions. And if nothing else, Isabel was quite the prize politically. With her, through her parents, came lands in England, Normandy, Wales, that's where the Earl of Pembroke title comes into it, and Leinster in Ireland. One of the main places in Leinster that William and Isabel held was Kilkenny Castle. And let me tell you, when we say William comes up everywhere, he comes up everywhere. <laughs> I do a lot of work on the history of witchcraft persecutions in Europe, and I have run across William even here. And no, he wasn't accused of witchcraft, and he didn't accuse anyone of it either, but there is a case that historians often point to as containing a lot of the hallmarks of later witch trials, and it happens in Kilkenny, Ireland in 1324-25. It's the case of Alice Keitler, if anyone is interested. But there he was, in Kilkenny, way before Alice, but still. Yeah, that's, he's everywhere. Everywhere. When William eventually drew up his will, he declared that all the lands that had come to him from his wife would go back to her upon his death. But despite being over two decades younger than her husband, Isabel would only outlive him by a year. She passed away in 1220 and was buried in Tintern Abbey in Wales. If you haven't figured it out by now, I mean, William was a master at managing the Angevins, which <laughs> is my next cool thing about him. He somehow started with Eleanor, went to the young king, rebelled against Henry II with him, then still got in good with Henry II, stayed with Henry II during his fights with Richard. And then when Richard became king, he not only kept his father's promise of the bride for William, whose attached lands and titles gave him significantly more clout and power, but he also kept William close. William spent a lot of time with Richard, and when Richard went off on crusade, William stayed behind as one of the powerful men of the realm who sought to keep things in check, which also meant dealing with Richard's younger brother, John, who didn't always play fair. <laughs> yeah. yeah. John. Yeah. At, this is kind of like the Disney Robin Hood portion of the evening. <laughs> At first, things seemed to be going okay, 
But once it was discovered that Richard had been taken captive and imprisoned on the continent, John started to flex his muscles. William was among those who, let's just say, pointedly made it clear that Richard was still king and John needed to calm down until John vacated the area for a while. You'd think, Much like all the other times William had to back the family members against each other, this would have backfired on him. But again, it didn't. By 1194, Richard was back, and William was again supporting him against John's overreach. But here's the thing, right? Richard was the King of England, yet John's titles included being a Lord of Ireland. William had land in both locations. So, even though William was more than happy to play supportive buddy to Richard, When it came to his lands in Ireland, he openly told Richard, look, you're great and all, but technically, John is my liege lord over there, so I can't do homage to you from my Irish lands, only for the other ones. And even though that made some people close to the situation go like, whoa, Richard was okay with it enough that William continued to be a valued asset to him up until his death in 1199. Then... William immediately shifted over to supporting John, and John responded to this by almost immediately giving William that title we talked about earlier, Earl of Pembroke. I'm just always so impressed by how he handled them. This is a man who, like, didn't start out with anything. He built himself up over decades of affiliation with this one family, which leads us to our next big thing, which also happens to be the exact opposite of what I just talked about. It's how he didn't continue his constantly successful streak with King John. Yes. When William was about 60 years old, which was in 1205, he hit a rough patch with King John. And like, (laughs) honestly, who didn't, right? Mm -hmm. John's inability to hold lands in France annoyed a lot of the English nobility, to put it mildly. John was not pleased with William's attempt to retain control of his lands in Normandy, which came at the price of William performing military services to the French king while he was in France. Kind of funny, since Richard essentially accepted William defending John's lordship over Ireland not too long before, but they were very different people. Oh, yeah. And I am critical of John for many things, but from the perspective of a medieval English king, I guess I can see where he's coming from in resisting one Mm -hmm. of his subjects paying homage to another king. Yep. John did not, however, accept the news gracefully. And in true King John fashion, he tried to get one of his knights to challenge William to a fight. No one accepted. John then demanded one of William's sons as a hostage to ensure that William behaved. And if there were a toss up as to who should get the marshal's ultimate loyalty, it would be John. It was a reactionary, kind of petulant move on John's part, very on brand. But also, this had to bring back memories for William about his own childhood when he was a hostage meant to ensure his father's good behavior. And William largely does play ball. He's at the English court serving the king, and he is part of the escort that takes the Scottish king to York in November of 1205. He stays at the English court until John leaves for Poitou in 1206, but William did not go back when John returned later that year. Also, in typical John fashion, John vacillated between trusting William and not trusting William. John's instances of paranoia and shifting trusts are so legendary. Yes. John ultimately allows William to go check on his Irish estates, but also demands that one of his sons stay back as a hostage. This trip to Ireland ended up being tough for the marshal, and There is some political fighting and some power struggles happening. And a lot of William's supporters end up deserting him. At one point, William was accused of helping William de Bruges, who was formerly a favorite of King John and who was at this point an enemy. It turned out mostly fine for William. John summoned him to appear before him in England and 
John had his tantrum and says that William intends him all kind of harm. And William responds eloquently, the history tells us. And John takes one of William's castles, but he lets him go, even if he does reportedly hold a grudge for a while. The historian David Crouch calls the period from 1206 to 1213 a, quote, biblical seven years in the political wilderness, which is an appropriately dramatic way of putting things. William has a bit of a political comeback, though, in 1213 after sucking up the appropriate amount to King John and he plays the part of royalist once again and is helping John out with the grumbling barons and represents John at various meetings with the baronial party. He may have sincerely been on John's side, either because of some residual personal or familial affection, or because deep down in his heart of hearts, William Marshall was a royalist on principle, no matter what. But he may also have been keeping his foot in that political camp while his son, William Jr., was keeping his foot in the other by backing the barons. Who could say? There is some contemporaneous evidence that basically gives the side eye to William's motives. So insert emoji shrug here. So for this particular cool fact about William Marshall, you could say that he just has one incredible comeback story and leave it at that. Yeah, and it really shows how even after a period of being pushed aside, he was still able to keep his head and balance things. Yeah. In July of 1215, there was a Barons War. There are a few in English history, but this particular one is pretty famous because it started in June of 1215 with King John getting Magna Carta. <laughs> Magna Carta literally means Great Charter in Latin. And this document is most well known for what it had to say about baronial rights and curbing royal power. And John was strongly pressured to sign this at Runnymede. The Pope didn't hold John to it, and neither did John. And that led to the First Barons' War. William Marshall did help negotiate the terms of Magna Carta, and he is one of the 27 people who signed it. The 1215 Magna Carta. Anyway, Magna Carta was issued a few times. Henry III, who was John's son, did reissue it, but had some strong edits. <laughs> Edward I reissued it too, and you can actually see a copy of that one on display at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. You can see the original 1215 version at the British Library. Historians used to believe that William Marshall was one of the main authors of Magna Carta, but more recently, the view is that he was a voice of negotiation, and it's really impossible to tell how much he contributed to the text of the document itself. While Magna Carta was being negotiated, one of the meetings happened at Temple Church in London. Alert, remember that location for later. Temple Church was the headquarters for the Knights Templar in London, and these negotiations were not productive. <laughs> when everyone met again a few months later to try again, it was William Marshall who told the barons in London that John was ready to agree to their terms. John was at Windsor, which was near Runnymede, which was the faded spot. And honestly, John wasn't long for the world at this point. Magna Carta happens in 1215. Side note, I remember like it was yesterday when in like 2013, Magna Carta was like trending on Twitter. And I was like, oh my God, John is having a moment. And it ended up being about a new Jay-Z album. I had that moment too. Yeah, I was fooled. I should have known better. But anyway, so Magna Carta is in 1215 and John didn't outlive it by much. He passed away the following October. William Marshall has now outlived, in order of death, Henry the Young King, Henry II, Richard I, Elnor of Aquitaine, who died in, I believe, 1204, and had been his entry into the family, you may remember from last time, and John. He was no longer a young man, but he was still going strong, and that's why we have our next big thing. He 
basically became the next king's guardian. He did. After King John died, William Marshall started to act as regent. He oversaw John's funeral at Worcester Cathedral, and he took responsibility for the new king, John's son, who became King Henry III, and who was only, like, approaching 10 at this point. And William formally starts using the title regent, or guardian, on the 12th of November, 1216. William then spent years defending the royalist cause and the young King Henry. A lot of people who had deserted him before were now cozying back up. He's 72 at this point, and he's still a knight-fighting machine. There was a siege at Lincoln Castle by the French who were taking advantage of the baronial upset, and the marshal was there, personally fighting. Nicola de la Haye, another about 70 years old badass, was <laughs> the castellan defending Lincoln, and she did a pretty good job, too. But it was the marshal's royalist forces who lifted the siege. The French were ultimately driven from England, due in no small part to William Marshall. But unfortunately, all good things come to an end. And if you've been counting, we're at our final royal served by William Marshall. But that also means our next big cool thing is here, which is William's final resting place. In January of 1219, William Marshall became ill. We aren't sure exactly what he was suffering from. The history is pretty vague about it all and just says he was taken with an illness that was painful and that progressed. Some historians speculate that it was bowel cancer, but really, no one knows. He suffered for a few months. He traveled to the Tower of London where he saw the kingdom's best physicians, but they really couldn't do much to help him. William realized his time was up and he left for his estate at Caversham. The history goes into a lot of detail about William Marshall's deathbed, the things he said, and how he settled his affairs before he died on May 14, 1219. His body was taken back to London and he was buried at Temple Church, that same Temple Church where Magna Carta history happened not only a few years before. He's still there, resting in effigy with his sons, William and Gilbert, beside him. And you can visit him. I did. I always do when I'm in London. I like to pop in and say hi. I do feel like we're old friends at this point. <laughs> I think you are. Back in uh, 2014, I was in London. I was determined to go <laughs> visit William Marshall at Temple Church. And I remember vividly how it felt to be there. There were like four effigies. One, I believe, was labeled something like Effigy of a Knight. And the other three labeled as William Marshall and William and Gilbert, the placard. And I took a picture of it. So I'm actually going off of that. Said that they had been in that formation since like 1841 when a man named Edward Richardson had, and this is a quote, overconfidently identified <laughs> one of them as the first William Marshall when prior to that, a different one of the four was identified as his. So this <laughs> makes me laugh because they're like, it might have been right. It might not have been. So I suppose the point... Overly confident. I love that too. Yeah. I'm going to post a picture of that on our website so you can all see that that's what it said. So <laughs> I suppose the point there is one of the effigies is our William Marshall, but it may or may not be the one identified as such. Also in uh, 1941, during the Blitz in World War II, Temple Church was hit by a bomb. So really, we're lucky to have anything of the effigies or the church left at all. Yeah. And we have put some of our pictures from our respective trips to Temple Church up on the blog post for this entry. So you can see them for yourselves. You can tell just how delighted we are to be there, too. Yeah, I think you'll like them. Also, the William Marshall story doesn't end with his death. And I don't just mean because we can still visit Temple Church to see his final resting place, or even because we can read the famous biography we've talked about through this pair of episodes. What I mean is that William's story still fascinates people today, in part, for sure, due to the sheer volume of information mm. we have about him. So that means he pops up in pop culture now and again, which is our final big point about William Marshall. Now, Kristen, I don't know. Do you remember the first time you heard the name William Marshall? It's funny, or I don't know, maybe it's boring, but 
I first heard William's name in a book by Constance Bouchard called Strong of Body, Brave and Noble, which is about the evolution of medieval knighthood. And at one point, she's talking about the juvenis, which literally means young people in Latin. And it's this group of sons who aren't going to inherit, who aren't entering the church, and who are trained in warfare. How they spent their young knight years going to tournaments, trying to make a name and money for themselves. And she says that probably the best known Juvenus was William Marshall, who ah. made a fortune on the tournament scene and who went on to be the regent of England. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I've never heard of this guy. He sounds awesome. And probably I was also a little insecure because he was so famous and oh. I hadn't heard about him. <laughs> so I read and I kept reading and it was just one wow moment after another for me. I like that yours was an academic book and mine is about to not be. <laughs> My first encounter with him was in Sharon K. Penman novels. I know regular listeners are probably tired of hearing me talk about her work, but I'll also probably never stop because it was so influential on me. She's great. Yeah, she's great. William turns up in several of her books, though he's never the star because her focus is usually on the royals, uh, you know, Matilda, Stephen, Henry II and his sons, or like the Welsh princes. He definitely appeared in the first of her novels that I read, Here Be Dragons. Oh, so good. Yes, which is about the conflict between King John and Welsh Prince Llewellyn Farr, who was married to John's illegitimate daughter, Joan or Joanna. But my most vivid memory of him in my early days of devouring her books is in When Christ and His Saints Slept, her novel about the anarchy that we talked about in part one. And she dramatized the standoff between King Stephen and William's father. I highly suggest looking up those novels and Penman's others about the era and playing like find William Marshall in them <laughs> <laughs> because it's fun to see where he pops up. He's like Waldo. Yes! If you're looking for historical fiction that puts him like at the center of the action, I'd turn more to Elizabeth Chadwick. She has several books about him that are great. The Greatest Knight is the first half of his life story, and The Scarlet Lion looks more at his life after his marriage to Isabel de Clare. There's also Templar Silks, which I'm ashamed to say I have not yet read, but I have put on my Christmas list <laughs> since having this revelation. That one imagines in part what might have happened when he was in Jerusalem. That's just part of being an historian. Just FYI, you have tons of books <laughs> on your to read list and it never gets smaller because you yes. just keep adding to it. It's them. true. Yeah. I'm honestly surprised that there aren't legions of novels speculating about that era since we don't know what happened when William Marshall was in Jerusalem. It would be a free for all. Mm -hmm. His life would also make a great miniseries. Mm -hmm. Maybe HBO should pick it up. Call us, HBO. <laughs> we're here. Yes, we're here for you. HBO or BBC or ITV or Stars, whoever wants it. We need a proper epic William Marshall story. Like, we don't have that yet. At least not one that I've ever heard real sustained chatter about. What we do have, though, includes three films. William Marshall pops up in the form of William Hurt in the Ridley Scott Robin Hood starring Russell Crowe. Then there's Ironclad, which came out in, I think, 2011 and starred Paul Giamatti as King John and James Purifoy, who I love, as, wait for it, Thomas Marshall. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Purifoy's Thomas Marshall happens to be a Templar knight entangled in a confrontation between John and Barons at Rochester. It was quite frankly not a great movie, <laughs> but it was impossible not to think, William Marshall inspiration every time James Purefoy was shown as Thomas Marshall or with his big old red Templar cross. Christina's being too kind about this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted it to be great. Yeah. We get a little bit more Williamisms in the older but much better film, A Knight's Tale, where mm -hmm. Heath Ledger played William Thatcher, who was at least partially inspired by our William Marshall. Although, yes, Canterbury Tales is often cited as a major influence on the film, but it's really hard not to watch him in a tournament, even if it's not the melee kind of tournament, and not think of William Marshall. Yep. But alas, we are still waiting for a true William Marshall film or miniseries. And if it ever does come, we are going to judge it harshly, but <laughs> hopefully we'll love it. 
We want to love it. I really hope we can really love it if it ever happens. Speaking of love-hate, as our closer, I just want to mention that in May of this year, 2022, William Marshall was in the news. Found that out while I was working on this episode. After several years of work from the Pembroke and Moncton Local History Society and creator Harriet Addyman, a statue of William Marshall on horseback was unveiled outside of Pembroke Castle. Okay, so it was criticized, as you would expect, by some as honoring a man who was a medieval oppressor. After all, he was an Englishman who inserted influence over the Welsh and Irish that they didn't ask for, while others celebrated it because of how, you know, admirable um, and influential William was in medieval history. The pictures I saw of it looked great. I mean, I would like to see it. Maybe that should be our next field trip. I'm ready. I would love that. Thank you, everybody, for following along with us. Please don't hesitate to let us know through social media. We're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest. What your favorite William Marshall life event was. We would love to hear from you. You should also, if you can, visit footnotinghistory.com for further reading suggestions and the fun photos pertaining to William, as well as to learn more about us, your hosts, and to learn how to help support the podcast. Our next episode is going to be our second annual history for the holidays. But until then, remember, the best stories are in the footnotes.